Okay, this talk is about uh, attention deficit disorder and its treatment with stimulants. Uh, first of all, just a quick slide to refresh us on the anatomy of a neuron. Here's a neuron cell body. There's a nucleus where the DNA is. Typical action potential begins at the axon hillock. It travels down the axon to the axon terminal. This causes a calcium influx into the axon terminal. Neurotransmitter is released from the presynaptic neuron. It travels to the synaptic cleft. Neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft to the postsynaptic neuron and exerts an effect on the postsynaptic neuron. So that's how it basically works. Here is a typical synapse. This one is drawn already for serotonin, but it's the same thing essentially for dopamine. The neurotransmitter is released. It binds with a receptor on the postsynaptic neuron. Then the neurotransmitter is cleared from the synaptic cleft rapidly so the neurons can fire on and off and it has a reuptake transporter to go back into the presynaptic neuron. This is pretty standard uh, neuron synapse physiology. In, our, in the case of dopamine it would just be dopamine but then when you give a blocker to increase dopamine in the synaptic cleft like a, uh, like a stimulant would do this would be the dopamine um, transporter versus, you know, in serotonin, it's going to be the CERT, serotonin reuptake transporter. With dopamine, it would be the dopamine uh, transporter to bring it back into the presynaptic neuron. So the compensation when there's increased dopamine in the synapse will be to decrease the number of receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. So you downregulate the receptors, making the postsynaptic cell less sensitive to dopamine. You can increase the number of reuptake transporters, try to make them able to outcompete the drug. You can also produce fewer synaptic vesicles, so less of the neurotransmitters released into the cleft. So the point is the synapse, the neurons, are going to make compensatory adaptations to whatever drug you give. They're not going to stay static. So the drug is going to change the brain. And do we really know enough about the brain to be trying to intentionally change it? When you look at long-term studies, the answer to that question is obviously no. All these drugs in the long term cause brain damage. Okay, so uh, attention deficit stimulants. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about this book right here, Brain Disabling Treatments in Psychiatry by this author, Peter Bregan. He's a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. The guy's brilliant. Um, this entire book just goes for the pharmacology. It's the best book if you want to know the pharmacology of these drugs. There's a lot of other good books that are going to show you something worth knowing. You know, this is a really bright guy, Whitaker, Robert Whitaker, Anatomy of an Epidemic. And he's got a bunch of videos, Whitaker Online, about... Uh, these books. Uh, we're going to talk too about Grace Jackson's book, Drug Induced Dementia. She's a psychiatrist, real bright, goes through all the um, autopsy studies done on animals and showing the effects of these drugs, as well as some of the studies done on humans. Okay, um, what is attention deficit? It's basically anything that annoys a teacher. You know, it includes being hyperactive, impulsive, not paying attention, fidgeting in one's desk, talking out of turn, teasing the other kids getting out of one seat, being running around. So in the old days, you know, kids might get spanked. You know, when my brother was in high school, he's older than me, he would get paddled in high school, you know, bend over, smack your butt with a paddle. And while we, you know, people think that's such a bad thing nowadays. Oh, you should never spank a student or a child. You know what? No long-term side effects from that as far as I'm aware. Um, but are there long-term side effects from putting kids on these drugs? You bet there are. When these kids stay on these drugs chronically, chronically it causes brain damage uh, in a big way. Uh, so nowadays, the teacher wants to get at a kid. She's not allowed to spank them. She can just send them to the school nurse, psychologist, get them evaluated, write a note home to the parents, get the kid drugged. It makes the teacher dangerous to the student. That's bad. They should be friends. Um, when I was a kid, I was hyperactive. I, you know, I, th I think in retrospect, it's because I was smart. I'd get the homework done in five seconds, and then I would goof around, try to make my friends laugh. But I got in a lot of trouble. I got suspended from school. I was even taken out of the regular classrooms and put into a pod, an experimental classroom, where I had to be by myself and just read because I was too disruptive to the class. Um, nowadays, for sure, I would have been drugged. Okay. Um, what causes attention deficit disorder? School's boring. Okay, it's real boring. You're forced to attend against your will, and then you're forced to listen to topics of lectures. You don't get to pick your classes like in college. You're forced to listen to whatever the school says you have to listen to as if they really have your best intention at heart. And then you have to do all kinds of stupid stuff like memorize a list of vocabulary words. I would be at home 
and I would talk to my dad and my uncle, and we would be talking about why did the United States get involved in Vietnam War? Do you think this was a good ex uh, you know, reason for this or that? And I'd be reading books about the Vietnam War. I'd be reading all kinds of interesting stuff, having interesting conversations with my dad and my uncle. Okay, And then I got to go to school and memorize, you know, the cat sat on a hat and do what the teacher said and, and fill out a vocabulary list. And it was degrading and insulting and boring. Could you imagine if you took an adult and you forced them against their will to sit in a classroom listening to the kind of stuff kids have to listen to in school and, you know, them getting in trouble if they get out of their seat, if they talk, if anything. It'd be hard to sit in a classroom eight hours a day and listen to the kind of stuff kids have to listen to in school, okay? Um, I, I've, if you ever looked at a, a textbook, they they make sure that there's nothing interesting in there. Anything interesting in there would be controversial. They can't have a controversial topic in there. So they would just waste endless amounts of time. And then people say, well, the kid needs to go to school to learn. Oh, really? How much do you learn in school? How much do you remember that was useful to you from grade school? You learned how to read. That was useful. Learned how to type in high school. That was useful. Uh, how much other stuff was actually useful to you? If I could live again, I would avoid school as much as I could. I would you know, try to just teach myself. Obviously, you don't know enough to teach yourself when you're young, perhaps. But if you're lucky enough to have a parent who homeschools you, you're a lot better off. Okay, what are other things that are thought to cause ADHD? There's some talk about them, you know, being contributed to by toxic preservatives in food. We're not going to go into all this stuff today. That's a topic for some other day. But MSG, MFG, aspartame, food dyes, caffeine, too much simple sugars, those are all thought to potentially make kids more hyperactive, misbehaved, etc. The chemical imbalance theory of neurotransmitters is bogus. It's really just a psychiatrist and a, a you know sales pitch. Um, it tricks parents into accepting putting their kid on these drugs. Average age of diagnosis for ADHD is about seven years old, which is around seventh grade. Some experts now claim that as many as 14% of boys and 6% of girls in that ballpark have ADHD. About 60% of them end up on medications. It's in the ballpark of about 10% of boys, 3% of girls are on medications for ADHD. That is many millions and millions of children. So basically, the modern medical system is poisoning. And I use that word based on extensive study of the subject. Is poisoning many millions and millions of children. That's bad, okay? And that's why I've said, based on... 30 years of working in the medical business and additional numerous years of studying it, you know, when I was a student, um, that you need to have love in the system. If you don't have love, you end up with this, you know, just money making, uh, taking advantage of patients. You have to have love in the system. And if you don't have love in the system, figure out how to put it there or go to healthcare workers who you think at least like you. You know, if they at least like you, they're less likely to poison you, okay? Uh, that's why Voltaire said, I want my doctor to believe in God so that he will not rob me. And nowadays I'd say, I want my doctor to like me, better yet, love me so that he will not. You know, this is fucking ridiculous. The more you read about what these child psychiatrists have done to children, the more awful it is. And it comes from the Ivy League Psychiatry University Medical Centers. They are pushing this big time, labeling as many kids as possible ADHD, and not just that. They're not going to stop with that. No, there's kids that are bipolar. There are kids that have all these other issues, and they're trying to get as many children as possible on these drugs. These are not good. If somebody tells you your kid needs this, try to figure it out on your own first. If you, you know, if need be, if you need help, go to a psychologist. Don't rush into the hands of a psychiatrist because there's too high a risk. They're going to put you on a brain damaging drug. Okay, what are some of the other things? Oh, they're saying the kids have depression, anxiety disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, all these other disorders, and then they medicate them. When I was in grade school, it was a long time ago, back in the 1970s, I never heard of a single kid on it. With, no one had attention deficit. There was no such thing. At least no such thing amongst common people. We didn't know about it. Um, attention deficit disorder wasn't a specific dis diagnosis in the... Um, DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatry, until 1980. And then they changed it around 1987 from ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, to ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And the psychiatrist just made this up. I mean, you could call it, the reason why they call stuff disorder, just so you know, too, disorder is kind of like, because they know it's not really a disease and they don't want to, they're sort of walking a fine line of rhetoric. We can call it a disorder based on just a bunch of symptoms that we group together. 
though it's not really a disease. There's nothing you find in the brain with this disease, okay? There's no specific drug that treats this specific problem. The drug effects are the same on volunteers as they are on these so-called attention deficit kids. Um, you got higher rates of medication uh, for attention deficit in poor kids and when the parents are divorced. So Bregan says, you know, the psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Bregan, he thinks it's because kids lack attention from their dads. They are more likely to goof off in school. I don't know, maybe they're just bored. It's another way to kind of subjugate and control the poor and lower their IQs. Um, Bregan says that 1993 studies failed to show any improvement from treatment with ADHD. Additional follow-up studies, as described by him, by Whitaker and others, haven't shown any benefit whatsoever to taking these drugs. And so not only do you not get a benefit in the child's behavior in the long term, but you then get all these brain-damaging side effects. There's no, there's no benefit long term. What a person, what a parent cares about is what's the long term effect on their kid. How will their kid do if you start medicating them as a seven year old? How will they be by the time they're a teenager? And what the long term studies have shown, they'll be worse off. So why would you want to do it? Doesn't make sense. Um, and oh, here's another thing. Watch out for. There's talk about they've tried to get mental health screening at schools. This is all evil crap, okay? Child psychiatrists do not like children. I mean, if you liked a child, you wouldn't poison the child, okay? Teach them a low-fat vegan diet, okay? Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done to help a kid. Make the curriculum in the school more interesting. Have them eat avoiding processed foods so they don't get all the chemicals in processed foods. There's a lot of things you can do to help somebody. Uh, kids become demoralized when the doctor tells them their brain is defective and they need to take a pill probably for the rest of their life. There's no long-term study at all that I could find or from all these books that said that they're of benefit, that, you know, they tried to prove there's a benefit. Believe me, the drug companies have made incredible efforts. The psychiatry departments have made incredible efforts to try to prove a benefit, but they can't because the negative effects are probably much worse than what the studies controlled by them even reveal. Uh, that would be my prediction, you know. Can you imagine that? Even under optimal conditions to make a bogus study to show that the drugs are beneficial. They can't show the drugs are beneficial. That's how bad the drugs are. They also tend to, stimulus, uh, to stunt the child's growth, make them shorter. Um, if I had to come up with a theme song for child psychiatry, it would be from Pink Floyd, Leave Those Kids Alone. It's really a disaster. Like if you are sitting out there and you haven't found the purpose you want to dedicate your life to and you want a good cause, you want to devote your life to doing something good, you know, it'd be hard to do better than devote your life to preventing psychiatric medications given to children. This is like an evil thing. This is something, you know, we like to look at the old ages and say, oh, you know, the Victorian age was evil and cruel. Look at Oliver Twist. They wouldn't give him a second bowl of soup, okay? <laughs> this is not a few isolated kids. This is millions and millions of children are, you know, have Ivy League drug dealers scheming to poison them. Okay, it's awful. It's really terrible. It was Harvard where they popularized the concept of juvenile bipolar disorder. Okay, I think I read a book by a Harvard doctor on, you know, recommending stimulants for attention deficit and whatnot. It's evil, okay? Okay, and it's, you know, it's a way to get grant money. You know, you, you promote these types of things and a lot more drugs are going to be sold. It's bad. Okay, side effects. This is just some of the side effects. They make the kid like a sad, unhappy, drowsy, uninterested in others. Zombie-like, you know, and as Bregan would say, effects varying based on dosage, but like a lobotomy, okay? <laughs> you want to do that to a poor kid? The kids can be lethargic, listless, crying. It's going to depend on the dosage, and there's some variability of children responses. If you try taking them off, they get rebound syndromes once they become addicted and it's chronic. They can have manic episodes, psychotic episodes, be agitated, have nightmares, insomnia, blurred vision, hallucinations. These are powerful effects on the brain. They'll have a tendency sometimes to develop tics, Tourette's, tremors, delirium, confusion, hallucinations. They can go into a coma. Um, they can even get a heart attack. They can have cardiac side effects. Um, there's a, they can commit suicide. Eventually, they often end up on multiple drugs. That's called polypharmacy for additional bogus disorders that can be added on like childhood, juvenile, bipolar. Their IQ from the brain damage is lowered, less ability for sophisticated thinking. 
They can become unemployable. They can end up on mental health disability. It's bad. Okay, the stimulants given to kids act on the same parts of the brain as cocaine. These drugs have a lot of overlap with cocaine. Can you imagine if you heard that a kid was buying cocaine on the side on their own, using their parents' money, you'd say that's very bad behavior and that's very self-destructive behavior. But if a Ivy League psychiatrist sells your kid a, a cocaine-like medicine, that's health? No, it's stupid. I'm sorry, but the parents are let their kids take these pills are chumps, man. Cocaine has a shorter half-life. And, and by the way, I'm not, I don't have anything to do in this field. I don't work in child psychiatry. I'm, I don't need prescribe any of these drugs. I have nothing to do with any of this. I'm simply a person who's a doctor who's studying the brain, okay? And I'm actually studying the brain, trying to understand the glutamate synapses that cause excitotoxicity as a form of neurodegeneration, dementia in older people. And I just come across this literature as I'm studying, you know, uh, how brain synapses work. And then I'm just shocked by how bad these psychiatric drugs are. They're a disaster. Trust me, I'm understating how bad they are. If you read about them, you will be shocked at how bad they are. Um, you know, giving children a drug that's known to be very similar to cocaine and amphetamines. It's insane, okay? Imagine, okay, I talked about the kids taking speed on the street. You would say he's become a drug addict and the drug dealer is a bad person. God. Okay, cocaine, amphetamine, and speed, methylphenidate are very similar drugs. I list the book right here, like BDT is Brain Disabling Treatments, and that's the page, page 300. And for other spots I'll have, there's a few other books I'm going to reference, and I'll list the page numbers too. So anybody who wants to, like let's say you have a family member or a kid, this is being talked about, you can look this stuff up real fast. Methylphenidate is in the same schedule of drugs. I mean, the same category of drugs as amphetamines and morphine, okay? Those are incredibly powerful drugs that are very capable of causing serious brain damage. Okay? I recently saw a couple strokes from opioids. Um, kids sometimes will sell their methylphenidate. Yeah, it's a drug of abuse. Um, a 28-year 20 year, follow-up, one study um, listed in the, the Bregan book, the kids treated with stimulants were more likely to end up on other drugs, tobacco, cocaine, amphetamine. So this is polypharmacy is when it's a prescribed drug. This is just multi poly substance abuse. Uh, methylphenidate has the same effect on normal kids as ADHD kids, so it's not a tr specific treatment. Effect. It's not like this treats a specific disease. It just causes brain damage and you know, making a kid zombie-like, the teacher likes that. So it's good for the teacher. She gets a kid that's easier to manage, he's docile. But it's not good for the kid. It makes him stupider. It impairs his social skills. It impairs his social esteem. And it long-term sets him up for lots of problems in, in general. Methylphenidate and amphetamine are powerful drugs. They cause changes in the brain's metabolic activity as demonstrated on PET scans. Numerous references to that effect. Uh, Bregan claims that they cause decreased blood flow and oxygen to some areas of the brain and increase the risk of neurons dying, brain cell death. You really want to give your kid a drug that kills the brain cells, some of them, not good. Bregan claims that stimulants have no proven benefit beyond possibly uh, in the first few weeks if you call forced uh, docility, you know, a beneficial effect. Again, the teacher will say, oh, he's so much better because the kid doesn't talk in class anymore and behaves himself. But then if you ask the kid a complex question, you'll see they've got less ability to think in a sophisticated way. And life is tough, you know. You need to have your brain to help guide you through life. There's so much BS that sort of sets you back in life. You need a good brain to be able to think your way out of it. All the sort of traps that are set to just lower you. Stimulants do not help the child learn. Yeah, they make the kid dumber. What kids need is, you know, good teachers, good books, a good activities, good coaches. They don't need neurotoxic drugs. Okay, Anatomy of an Epidemic. This is the book by Whitaker. And Whitaker, like I said, has a whole bunch of online videos. He's a very bright guy. He's a very good writer. And he tells you the truth. So you learn a lot. If you want to just look up Robert Whitaker, if you want to uh, hear a bunch of lectures on neuropsychopharmacology, he tells it like it is. He doesn't have any, you know, dog in the fight, so he don't really care, nor, nor do I. I can give a rat's ass about psychiatry. And, in fact, this whole process of studying has made me sad because my father was a psychiatrist. And I already told you about my dad. He was a good man and a good father. 
and he never once lied to me. He was always a good guy, but you know he was a boxer in college. He's like United Kingdom champion. Um, then he told me he quit boxing because he's afraid he'd end up with head trauma and brain damage. And you know maybe he did get some brain damage because when I was young, I had a lot of good conversations with my dad, and I couldn't wait when I went off to college. And then I went through my med school and residency. I was studying like a maniac. I couldn't wait till I got a little older in my 30s. And I would read all these books. I came home. I wanted to have these challenging conversations with my dad and my uncle again. And, you know, like I said, you know, when I was in my fellowship at Harvard, I would have to defend vascular disease against three vascular surgeons who hated my guts. So I was very used to reading all their literature, reading all their textbooks, going to the training courses, going through the VHSA. So the point was I was maxed out on, you know, tough, intense intellectual debate with people who are very smart and hate my guts. I'm very used to that, okay? And so what I'm trying to say is when I came back home to talk to my dad and my uncle, I could just intellectually kick their asses so bad I felt sorry for them. And don't get me wrong, I'm grateful to them. They helped me a lot growing up. But what I'm trying to say is how could a good man prescribe all these psychiatric drugs? And I think the answer is what happens to the average doctor is they are exhausted. I gave that video about the life of a doctor. And they just accept whatever they're told by the influence leaders coming out of these big name universities and uh, medical centers. And so they just do what they're sort of told to do. And there's so much placebo effect and disease variability that they really don't pick up on it until perhaps kind of later. And they don't read about it. Most, you know, and my dad would read every night, but he would read most, I mean, he did have a whole bunch of journals. I don't know how much he read them. Whenever I saw him reading, he was always reading a book. And my dad read for a different reason than me. He read for entertainment. He'd read about a novel or he'd read about the lives of composers. I mean, I remember one time he was reading The History of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. So I read the same book. I was a freshman in, in uh, high school and I read the book, but I didn't understand it at all. I thought I did, but I didn't understand it at all. But the, the reason I say all that was, you know, the way I read is quite different from my father. I am trying to understand diabetes. I am trying to understand brain synapses so I can understand neurodegeneration. I don't read, and don't go wrong, I sometimes read just for pleasure, but I'm almost always, I'm reading, trying to understand something with a sp very, very specific purpose. Um, and I think that's why I got a better memory and understanding what I read than just reading for random pleasure. I mean, that's nice, but anyways, um, let's see. ADHD diagnosis usually come from the teacher's complaints. A lot of times these kids are fine at home. They're kind of fine in the doctor's office. They're just labeled bad by a teacher, and then their parents let them go along. So, And this by far happens. There's more stimulants prescribed in the United States, at least there was a couple years ago, than in all the rest of the world by far. This is sort of an American thing, and I'm sorry, but a lot of American parents are chumps, and divorce is really common nowadays too. You know, and a lot of times maybe the mom can't handle the kid, but usually moms can handle boys pretty well until they get to about seventh grade. That's when they get stronger and bigger and a little wilder with their puberty. The standard lie told to parents is that ADHD has a, you know, causes a chemical imbalance of a neurotransmitter and the drug will help to fix it. But that's not true, and psychiatrists know that's not true, but that's often what gets told to families and parents. The imbalanced sales pitch, it's well known that this is bogus. Methylphenidate is thought to work primarily as a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. So sort of like what an antidepressant is to being a reuptake inhibitor for serotonin, for example, or the SNRIs also for norepinephrine. That's what the stimulants are for dopamine. And that's what cocaine is. Excessive dopamine in a synapse, like we said, talks about causes compensatory adaptations like downregulation of the postsynaptic receptors, etc. It changes the brain. There was no neurotransmitter imbalance initially, but the drug causes it. That's kind of the big joke, is that the drug causes the problem that it claims to treat. The, the treatment is worse than the disease. Um, and then it also affects other synapses. You know, it doesn't just affect the serotonin, the dopamine synapse. It also affects serotonin synapses, norepinephrine synapses. And that reminds me, Dr. Klaper had a really good lecture. He's a famous nutrition doctor. He had a really good lecture where he says, you can't change one thing because when you change one thing, you change a bunch of other things. And that's another thing. I'll talk about it in another lecture, but there's a tremendous amount of interrelated activity between serotonin synapses, norepinephrine synapses, dopamine synapses, and glutamate synapses. As a matter of fact, in the brain, glutamate is the most common neurotransmitter, about 80% of neurotransmitters, depending on what you read and different sources, but it's in that ballpark. Serotonin and norepinephrine help to modulate 
uh, glutamate synapses. Okay, so the fact that so many things are interrelate, interrelated, you can't just control one isolated little thing with these brain-changing drugs. And that's partly why they're so dangerous, especially in a young person, because their brain's going, undergoing rapid uh, formation. You know, in a boy's frontal lobes, they're not even myelinated fully until his late 20s. Okay, that's pretty rapid brain growth. And even in an older person, you still got a lot of synaptic plasticity, a lot of changes in your synapses. Okay, so this reminds me like of the antipsychotic medications given to patients in a mental hospital. It's good for the staff, making the patient easier to control, but it is bad for the patient, causing brain damage, making them like zombies, and the ADHD drugs are pushing in that direction. Good for the teacher, but not for the student. Um, long term, it is not going to help your kid to have a good functioning, optimal brain. Um, remember, antipsychotics lead to a lobotomy-like effect, you know, and ADHD drugs are not as powerful, but they are messing up the dopamine system, and that is not good. And I would also say, if there was no money, imagine nobody made a cent. People just did what they thought was best for children. Do you think anyone would be prescribing these drugs? I would bet you it would be zero. If, if there was not a financial incentive to prescribe drugs to children, do you think they would be done? I don't think there'd be any need for it. There are psychiatrists like Bregan. He never prescribes drugs, okay, other than when he's trying to taper a patient with withdrawal. Kelly Brogan. Kelly Brogan, you know, that uh, Irish-Italian lady psychiatrist, she says psychiatric drugs don't work. You know, she, I don't know exactly what she does in her practice, but I'm under the impression from hearing her talk and reading her book that she doesn't give them almost never except perhaps for withdrawal taper. But I'm not 100% certain about that. But that's my impression from hearing her talk. You know, she's a smart lady. Okay, and then you'll hear that from other persons who have studied psych. That's a pretty common thing. Unless somebody's making money off it, in my experience, almost everybody I've read, this is what they say. Unless they're getting money for somehow to promote these drugs or to sell them, um, I don't hear anybody who's like independent uh, who's saying these things are beneficial. Um, the kids have worse behavior on long-term follow-ups. Um, and they're often turned into chronic mental patients. Okay, we're, I just think we're finishing up here. I think this is the last slide. Oh, and maybe I got one more after this, but this might be the last one. So anyways, the drug-induced dementia is a perfect crime. Oh, shit. By Grace Jackson. Here's the book, brilliant book. And she basically went through an extensive study. She's a psychiatrist herself, bright lady, of how these drugs... They just push people towards dementia. And then what happens, psychiatry is weird. It always tries to blame the person's cognitive impairment on their intrinsic disease. Oh, they're cognitively slow because they're depressed. Cognitively slow because they're bipolar. No, they're cognitively slow because they've been poisoned with these drugs and the you know age match, demographic match controls of the same age have better function that didn't get drugged. Okay, uh, Dr. Jackson, she's good at going through the animal pathology studies showing stimulants cause brain damage and other types of psychiatric drugs cause brain damage. There were John Hopkins uh, Hospital researchers giving stimulants to kids back in the 1960s. It's insane. And the reason, like, why would I say that's insane? We know, anybody who watches my shows probably has studied the vegan diet, that it has incredible benefits for people. And how come none of these universities is promoting the vegan diet? I'm not aware of a single university doctor, not one, who promotes the vegan diet. There might be a few rare ones nowadays, but I can tell you, I've never seen one of the famous nutrition experts come from a big university. Never. Not once. Look at the big, the big great ones. McDougal, he did it all on his own. Look at Esselstyn. He did it on his own. Yes, he's from the Cleveland Clinic, but they didn't even want him there. He did it on his own. Um, Kempner was supported by Duke back in those days, but he was before the pharmacology was available, and he was doing it out of his own volition. Um, but there is no, I mean, you want to, you know, how do you say I love you in medical words? Here's how you become a vegan, okay? You want to really help somebody, teach them how to become a low-fat, low-sodium vegan. Okay, when methylphenidate is given to rats, it causes brain damage with loss of brain neurons, dopamine and norepinephrine types. She goes through multiple studies that shows that. Dr. Jackson also claims the research has repeatedly shown poor outcomes for stimulants, um, especially long-term. And she goes over a Castellano study, which some people tried to claim showed some benefit. And she analyzes it in more detail and shows, in her opinion, it was harmful. Dr. Jackson says that all 
the major categories. That's all of them uh, of psychiatric drugs cause brain damage. Like I said, Kelly Brogan, psych drugs don't work. Peter Bregan, psychiatric drugs cause much more harm than benefit. Peter Gotsky, he's a very famous researcher, one of the most famous researchers in the world. He says psychiatric drugs also cause much more harm than benefit. Robert Whitaker, we talked about it. He, he writes all about what a disaster psychiatric drugs are. So I think that's my last slide. Yep. So anyways, um, be advised. You know, try to help these poor kids. And I uh, hope that's helpful.